uh, the Internet Caucus, uh, the Republican Chair, Representative Bob Goodlatte from Virginia, and Representative Rick Boucher. Uh, please say hello to the, the members. Uh, they they are they are uh, have uh, put together the Internet Caucus. Uh, uh, they they chair it. It's got 160 members. They are responsible for 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 uh, putting together a caucus that really wants to educate members about uh, the future of the internet. Uh, the advisory committee of 160 organizations is very proud to work with them, uh, representing all sides of all of the issues. Uh, uh, both of the, our, our chairs uh, have to leave uh, in a few minutes because votes are going on the floor. Uh, uh, I've asked them if they would like to say a few words. They, they, they usually have words of wisdom for us. Uh, 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 represent <coughs> Representative Goodlad has yielded all of his time to uh, Representative Boucher, who has asked for uh, f five or seven minutes to talk to us about what he considers a very important issue before us, and then I will get to the, the panel uh, uh, forthwith. Representative Boucher. <laughs> Well, Jerry, thank you uh, very much for that introduction, and I particularly want to take a moment this afternoon to thank you for the truly extraordinary leadership that you're providing for the Internet Educational Foundation, which is uh, a private sector-oriented uh, organization that has a very large membership of uh, companies and individuals who have a strong interest in the growth and development of the Internet and in the formulation of various policies here in the Congress uh, that affect uh, the Internet generally. Uh, it is an outstanding organization that sponsors directly this series of forums and other activities throughout the year. Uh, Jerry does a wonderful job in leading it. And Jerry, I want to say thank you for what you accomplish on behalf of the Internet Foundation and this caucus. I also want to say that it's a privilege um, to be here today uh, with my friend and colleague from Virginia, Bob Goodlatte, with whom I have the privilege of co-chairing the House component of the Congressional Internet Caucus. Uh, we uh, make an effort to attend as many of these forums as we can, and uh, both of us uh, have the opportunity to be here for a limited amount of time this afternoon. Let me say that I'm very pleased by the large attendance that we have enjoyed for this series of three Internet Caucus forums on the many challenging issues that are associated with broadband internet transport platform deployment. And I want to welcome the participants in today's session on the questions of tax incentives for broadband deployment and also on the need for access to broadband platforms for unaffiliated internet access providers and unaffiliated content providers. I'm going to focus my remarks this afternoon uh, on the access issues. In the last Congress, I was pleased to join with my colleague, Bob Goodlatte, in introducing the first legislative proposal to assure access for internet service providers to broadband transport platforms. In my view, the legislation with some refinements that I'll mention in a moment is still necessary, perhaps even more necessary now than in the past, given evolving technologies and emerging business plans and practices. <laughs> Open access in the narrowband world has been at the core of the Internet's phenomenal growth and development. For dial-up Internet service, which is still the pathway to the Internet for more than 90% of Internet users, open access has assured and continues today to assure a broad customer choice of Internet service providers. In the typical model, the customer uses the telephone wire as the platform for transport to the Internet but that customer typically has some company unaffiliated with the telephone company as the provider of internet access services. That right of access was provided in the Federal Communications Commission's Computer II order, which was adopted by the Commission in the 1980s. And that order clarifies that all facilities-based common carriers who choose to bundle basic transport with enhanced information services 
must separately offer the basic transport component to competing information service providers so that competitors have an avenue for bringing their innovative information services to the customer. Although deemed uh, an unbundling uh, of the basic from the enhanced service, this approach is a relatively modest requirement on the spectrum of possible regulatory schemes, and it does not lead to onerous burdens and intricate questions, such as defining network elements and prescribing various pricing models. It's a straightforward provision, and it's easily transportable to the world of broadband. But why is open access in the public interest? Let me just suggest a couple of reasons. First of all, it does promote and provide customer choice so that every user of Internet services has uh, an access to any Internet service provider that particular person wants to contract with. Secondly, it promotes competition and innovation in the offering of advanced <coughs> information services. And those uh, in the scholastic community who support a federal open access policy would say that this is the highest value. Uh, this is the reason for adopting open access that is the most important, uh, the competition and innovation that comes from uh, access to customers <coughs> so that information providers can compete one with the other in terms of the quality of the service they provide. The third reason is regulatory parity within broadband. Today, uh, based on that Computer 2 ruling, Open access is applied to DSL services offered by telephone companies. It does not, however, apply to the cable modem transport platform. And the federal government should not discriminate in terms of regulation with regard to essentially comparable services, which cable modem service and DSL services are. And achieving regulatory parity is very important. And the fourth major reason is to enable the approximately 7,000 uh, independent internet service providers around the country to be able to follow their customers when their customers migrate from the narrowband dial-up platform to the cable modem service, which is far faster and far more attractive. We have on the order of 10 million cable modem users in the United States today, and that number is rapidly increasing. And as that happens, these 7,000 companies, most of which are young and entrepreneurial and startup in nature, need to be able to stay in business and follow their customers. Now, some would say that we should simply trust the broadband providers to offer access voluntarily to their competitors. But in light of emerging developments, I have grave reservations about the wisdom and the workability of that approach. These developments suggest that the cable industry has enormous concern about competition from internet-based video streaming and will perhaps go to extraordinary lengths to protect its dominance in the provision of multi-channel video from that internet-based video streaming competition. And I'll offer two examples of what I'm referring to. Example number one is the recent decision by Charter Communications to remove from cable carriage ESPN News because the owner of the program wants to preserve the right to place the program on the Internet as well. Now that reflects a clear concern on the part of that major cable company about competition from Internet video streaming, and I think it is an extreme step to remove ESPN News from cable carriage. The second example may give even greater concern. A company called ICTV, which is partly owned by Adelphia, Liberty Media, and Cox Communications, and these are all cable-related companies, is developing a new interactive TV application for cable operators, which cable companies can sell to their customers. Now, there's nothing illegal and nothing improper about the service that ICTV is prepared to offer. But it does bespeak an attitude of deep concern about the Internet and the streaming media that it contains as a competitive threat to cable, uh, as uh, revealed in the minds of the cable companies that are supporting this application. The ICTV service offers to cable companies the ability to serve their customers with three graduated services with interesting and descriptive titles and functionalities. The first is called a walled garden, in which cable companies would offer, and I'm going to quote from the sales brochure, a highly controlled browsing environment of light content, end of quote. Uh, in this application, there would be no Internet access. The second is called a walled jungle, 
and it's uh, a somewhat expanded walled garden uh, with more extensive but still totally controlled information offerings. And once again, there is no internet access uh, offered. The third is called a fenced prairie. Uh, and I'm going to quote again from the sales brochure, which, quote, extends the walled jungle concept beyond a proprietary network to content partners on the web while circumscribing access to a defined range of approved web pages. Now that offers internet access, if you can call it that. But it's anything but a complete internet experience. And it obviously is an effort uh, to exert control over what kinds of programs are accessible over the cable interactive television platform. And so I have concerns about just how open the cable companies plan to be with access for unaffiliated ISPs who would offer not a defined range of approved web pages, who would not offer circumscribed access, but who would offer to their customers a complete and unrestricted internet experience. I believe that the time-tested and proven open access policy that has so well served the narrow band beginnings of the internet should be continued and applied to the internet's broadband future, and that the policy should be sufficiently broad to cover interactive applications, including interactive television. Well, perhaps these comments will serve as something of a stimulus for the discussion that will come on this panel. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank the panelists for their participation in our forum here today and welcome all of the participants and uh, wish you a good discussion on the access and uh, tax uh, provision issues. Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought. Uh, it is a critical issue. And uh, today, as a, we have a panel that uh, we're going to, again, uh, come back to the open access issue. We are going to start with the tax incentive issue. But uh, they raise uh, many debatable and critical issues. And so today, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, uh, well chosen, uh, Bob Berger, who's the president and CEO of, of CityNet. Um, he's formerly a senior vice president at Windstar, where he did all of its regulatory and telecommunications policy. But his company is engaged in laying the last mile in many of the cities uh, in this country. And what is unique and probably qualifies him to moderate this panel is that. Uh, he's, his company is laying uh, the last mile through the sewers of the cities of this co country using robots that don't tear up the city streets. And I know that while most of us care deeply about getting uh, broadband open access, lots of us who drive the city streets are all concerned about how we're getting it. Um, if he can get broadband laid without destroying the city streets, um, uh, then uh, having a discussion about how we get the last mile in a policy debate, he is the perfect moderator uh, for uh, this, uh, this panel, which has a diverse set of views on how we get there. Uh, Bob, uh, thanks for joining us. Let me turn it over to you, and you've got tax incentives, and then you've got a round robin. Right, Jared. Thank you, Thank Jared. You. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out on uh, an absolutely glorious day in, in D.C. Um, for those of you who, like myself, who may have been around here since they were kids, it's an unusual day. And to find all of you inside in a windowless room on a day like this in July, we probably should talk afterwards about, uh, about life choices. Um, I've gone through an interesting transformation in my previous life at Windstar. I used to spend most of my time as I went city to city looking up, looking for dish sites. And now I've taken a, what used to be a relatively good career and dedicated to the sewers. Now I look down for sewer manholes. And it leads to a whole series of jokes. We do collect them at CityNet. Anyone who would like to contribute after the panel uh, and the, the comments we're going to hear from all our panelists, we'd be happy to add them. There will be a website at some point with the uh, publicly printable jokes because uh, we do enjoy that. Given what I do, uh, we have a distinct appreciation and uh, of the importance of this country uh, having 
the transmission mediums uh, and the opportunities to deliver bro broadband services. And uh, certainly an appreciation for the tremendous technological, but more importantly, economic ramifications of that that go far beyond the fate of any one company or even of our telecommunications industry. The ripple effect go far beyond. We have a very distinguished uh, series of panelists. We actually have two panels today that we're going to do back to back. Each of the panelists bring their own unique perspectives and series of comments. Uh, so I know I very much am looking forward to that. Um, today's broadband forum is the 12th educational event hosted this year by the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Uh, we're pleased that you could come, particularly on this bright sunny day. Uh, I want to thank members of the Advisory Committee and the Broadband Task Force for planning this event, uh, particularly the Task Force co-chairs Larry Clinton of the U.S. Telecom Association, who I actually got to hear uh, for a bit yesterday at a previous event. This is kind of the talking thing around Washington these days. Uh, we should be commuting together. And also Rick Silman of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. We also want to thank the Internet Caucus co-chairs uh, for their leadership role in supporting this educational work, uh, Senators Patrick Leahy and Conrad Burns and Congressman Bob Goodlatt and uh, Rick Boucher. Uh, as you may know, the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee is a coalition of organizations including businesses, trade associations, nonprofits, and public interest groups that work together to provide educational programming about internet policy and technology. Uh, we've got several more events coming up soon this year, including an internet taxation event on Tuesday of next week, just down the hallway in room uh, SC5, as well as an e-learning event on September 11th. Uh, Anyway, that being said, we are going to do the tax incentive panels first. We're going to be very, uh, try to be very even-handed with everyone, so I have the, I think, unenviable task of trying to uh, gently but uh, politely enforce the time limits. Um, uh, each panel will have a total of 20 minutes. The tax incentive panel, uh, Adam Thier will go first, followed by Kevin Hassett. Uh, each panel will have uh, roughly 10 minutes, and in about nine minutes I'll kind of signal, and 10 minutes quite of, frankly, uh, stand up and probably gently tug on their sleeve just so that you're aware in advance. <laughs> uh, that be, and the order was pre-arranged. Was pre the panelists should not be surprised at the order I call you. Um, with, this, with that being said, I'd like to begin with the tax incentive panel and begin by introducing Adam Thier of the Cato Institute. Adam is the uh, Institute's Director of Cal Telecommunication Studies. Adam? Thanks, Bob. And I want to thank Jerry and the Foundation for inviting me here today to speak. I almost wish I was on the Broadband Access panel. That's what I do a lot more work on, the forced access issue. And, uh, and like Dennis Miller, I don't want to get off on a rant here, but I, I've got plenty of work on that, and I, I'm just infuriated by people who think that infrastructure socialism is the answer to our uh, broadband solutions in this country. But th that's another story. Again, I don't want to get off on that rant. I'm here to talk about broadband tax credits. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and wear that black hat since uh, I know when Jerry's gang called me and said, who, who do you recommend who could talk about broadband tax credits and uh, take a negative approach, you know, and, and it doesn't favor. So, well, I think you're probably talking to the only guy in town these days that doesn't support this concept. Because if you look around, it looks like everybody's lining up in support of this. Now, why is that? I mean, it, telecom policy is the most contentious issue I think I've ever seen in this town, just about. It's right next to abortion in terms of how much agreement you have, I think. And, and you have these two warring parties, you know, long distance and local always going at it, uh, cable versus everybody, you know, broadcasters. But on, on tax policy, everybody's for this idea of a tax credit. And, and it's unique because, you know, we have this advertising rule right now over broadband deregulation. It's what I like to call the equivalent of a sort of a Cold war S, you know, mad policy for telecom, you know, mutual assured destruction, where we just have enough advertising and, on television and enough lobbying in Congress and somehow we'll get something done and it just all cancels each other out. Well, this has probably led to the fact that we're so desperate for something to do on broadband now, we're now at tax credits. And let me lay out what I think are the problems with tax credits and start with that very first issue, which is that tax credits really ignores the fundamental problem in the broadband marketplace, which is the, the unbelievably complex legal quagmire that these companies find themselves in these days. The reason a lot of companies don't roll out broadband is because there is unlevel asymmetrical regulatory treatment, overlapping regulatory jurisdictions, crazy state and local tax policies with regards to telecom and cable carriers. I mean, th th there's so many barriers standing in the way legally and regulatorily of these companies providing broadband that that's the real disincentive. And so my second point would be that tax credits are not likely to catalyze or incentivize as much rollout, broadband rollout, as policymakers hope if you don't get that first problem straightened out first of the regulatory mess we find ourselves in. 
And, and again, with 10 or 20 cent, you know, 20 percent tax credits are discussed in the bill, the primary bills. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that if you don't figure out, say, the inner lot of mess first for the bells, this forced access mess first for cable, uh, you know, the rules that satellite providers and others face, they're going to look at that and say 10, 20 percent, mm, uh, I just don't know if that's going to make a difference when the legal footing is so shaky that we stand on. So I don't think that a 10 or 20 percent tax credit is really going to do as, as much good as I hope. But a more, more profound and important point, I think, is that tax credits are really unnecessary in an environment of proliferating choices. Uh, we have a forthcoming study by uh, Wayne Layton, uh, who's here in the audience today, and he did that before he joined the FCC for, for the Cato Institute. It will be on our website in a couple of weeks. And he talks about the incredible flowering of, of service competition in the broadband marketplace. A lot of people don't choose it because of the expense, so, you know, satellite service. My home, I have two cell phones, two satellite dishes. I'm ripping wires out of my walls. My wife and I have a corny phrase, wire-free wire by 2003. I don't know if it's going to happen, but, you know, we have to have Verizon to link our uh, satellite dish and, and order movies, but that's it. I don't have cable anymore. And I, 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 you know, I've got electrical wires, but we can't transmit elect electrons wirelessly yet, but maybe someday. But the fact of the matter is, is that those are choices I make. And they're choices that my mom and dad make living in rural Indiana. I, I drove in, uh, into rural Illinois where I was born uh, recently and, and, and drove by a farm where I saw an outhouse with a satellite dish attached to it. I mean, those are choices. I mean, these are ma being made. A lot of people don't want to pay 50, 60 bucks for the broadband connections, but they're coming. Why do we necessarily need tax credits? Um, another concern I have, tax credits could end up being advantageous to one set of providers relative to another. Now, I know the tax credit is supposedly technology neutral. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's likely, you know, oh, here, let's wire America. We need to wire America. Well, we've, you know, we've tried this once. We had this thing called the Rural Electrification Administration, and we, we've been down this road. But I don't want to see tax credits end up advantaging one set of providers, especially if they're wireline, relative to wireless. And I'm terribly afraid that's exactly what might happen in this marketplace. Um, and again, I talked about REA. I mean, I'm scared that the, the tax credit regime could become yet another expensive and perpetual Washington entitlement program. I mean, we've seen this before. The REA, you know, we wired America for electricity and had it done by the 50s, but still the REA lives on. They changed their name, added a new mission statement now to the RUS, Rural Utility Service, and they're rolling out their, their throwing subsidies to, to major multi-million billion dollar telecom corporations to roll out broadband. So we've got direct subsidies and now tax credits, indirect subsidies. Well, when does this stuff ever go away? Once you start it, it seems to have a life of, it own, of its own. It goes on and on and on and piles another burden on the American taxpayer. Final point, and this is, I think, the most profound one I can make, is that tax credits will further politicize what is a very dynamic industry. I mean, the fact of the matter is, what government subsidizes, it often ends up regulating. It is almost an iron law in the study of political science. And the fact of the matter is, we've already seen with regards to broadband deregulation, that it seems like you can't have any deregulation without an endless set of concurrent requirements, broadband rollout timetables, specific agendas for who to roll it out to when, how, and, and how much at the cost. So I mean, I'm, I'm terribly concerned that with tax credits comes a lot of concurrent requirements. And it explains why T.J. Rogers, in a piece for the Cato Institute uh, a couple of years ago, said that he cautioned against the high-tech industry, quote-unquote, normalizing relations with Washington, D.C. And he said in this, I think this is really the, an excellent point to conclude on, that, quote, the political scene in Washington is antithetical to the core values that drive our success in the international marketplace and risk converting entrepreneurs into status businessmen. I really think that uh, high, the high-tech sector should think twice before entering into this sort of a pact with Washington. Uh, the allure of broadband tax credits may seem too good to pass up at this point, but as with any deal with the devil, they'll be held to pay the next morning. So, Thank you very much. And by the way, this uh, I'm reading from a just-released report by Cato, Broadband Tax Credits, the High Tech Pork Bill begins. Available out there and on our website. Please go and sign up. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next, we have Dr. Kevin Hassett of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Kevin is a resident scholar uh, with AEI. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, it's a real honor to be here before you and, and to follow up after Adam, who's a minor hero of mine in, in telecom work. If you go and read the work that he's doing, then he's clearly a guy you'd let run the, the telecom sector. I'm not a telecom guy, which uh, these days seems kind of fortunate. Uh, it's one reason why I'm 
I, unlike Adam, I didn't come with three bodyguards uh, today. Uh, te telecom is an interesting area in economics because uh, pretty much if you count cable and using the, the back of my eyelids as, as the calculator, uh, I'd say probably you know seven, eight percent of all profits in, in the country uh, across all industries come uh, from telephone and, and cable, uh, those two uh, regulated monopolies. And the reason that they're able to make those profits, you may recall back when you were studying uh, economics, which I used to teach at, at Columbia, uh, that, that profits weren't something that you would expect to stay for a while. Well, the reason that they stay on all sides uh, for all players is that there's a, a big sort of uh, footprint advantage to being the person uh, with the shotgun sitting on a chair uh, guarding that last little connection to, to the house. Uh, now, if you think about uh, what the view of the world should be like after competition is introduced into all of these sectors, then it would be one where there'd be a zillion companies offering you a zillion services, and the ones that, that today are beating up on their competitors are the ones who innovated and came up with something cool that everybody wants that nobody else thought of. Uh, and and that's, that's where it could be. And the question is, how do we get there? And uh, to answer that question, let's say, well, how did I get here? Well, I uh, am a person who spent most of his career studying tax credits. Uh, most of the time, I think they're a really bad uh, idea. Uh, but there are circumstances when credits are admissible. First of all, uh, the, the first rule of economics really is try not to distort decisions. And so if you've got you know, 10 different kinds of machines, you know, some for broadband and some for cutting corn, then you wouldn't want to subsidize you know, the broadband and not the corn because then society would have an inefficient production technology. They would be using the cheap thing that you artificially made cheaper uh, rather than the thing that, that they should be doing. And um, there's a lot of evidence. In fact, I just wrote the, the review paper of this whole literature for something called the Handbook of Public Economics, which is the uh, book that PhD students use to learn tax uh, theory uh, in graduate school. Uh, and, and that literature shows that these things really have a big effect, that, that if, you, if you favor this over that, then sure enough, businesses go and do this over that, and that that has a negative effect on the economy because it distorts decisions. You, sh you shouldn't distort decisions if you're the government. But there are circumstances when you might want to do it. When might you want to do it? Well, for example, suppose, uh, just to use a, a tax example, suppose that the production of something creates a lot of pollution. Well, then we might want to tax that thing uh, to compensate for the fact that it produces pollution. Now, suppose, on the other hand, that the production of something produces something really beneficial uh, to society that, that's outside of uh, the direct product. Well, then you might want to subsidize it. But when you make the argument to subsidize it, you should be careful to make sure that you make the case that the benefits from sort of the positive externality of that th more of that being out there outweigh the costs of introducing uh, distortion. And so that's pretty much where you would want uh, to come down on credits. You would pretty much say no to credits unless there was some compelling reason why there was something special about the thing that you were looking at. Now, are there things uh, out there in the world uh, that are special? And uh, the, the obvious answer is yes. And one of my favorite examples of this is research and development. Uh, there have been a zillion studies of this, and if you want to look at them, you can go to the National Bureau of Economic Research website, nber.org, and just type in R&D. Uh, but there's been an R&D R &D tax credit. It's kind of a minor fundraising industry in, in this town. It keeps expiring and then coming back up, and you've got to raise lots of money to make sure it comes back. But, but the R&D tax credit is there, and it's actually pretty justifiable on economic grounds, uh, because the studies show us that if, if I'm a firm, and I invest in, in R&D to come up with some kind of new thing, uh, then I'll get about a 30% return on that investment. At least empirically, that's what I've gotten. But society gets a 50 to 60% return. And the reason is that when you discover something, then it makes it easier for somebody else to discover something else. And so we found that the R&D tax credit is actually something that both stimulates investment and has some economic justification because really we want to subsidize that stuff because the external non-capturable benefit of R&D is something that society benefits from. Now, the question is, is broadband something like that? And I think that there's an argument, although again, I'm not a telecom expert, there's an argument that it is an area where you could get something like that. Because I think one of the reasons why, uh, for example, I don't have broadband, uh, and I could, but, but I mean, probably many of you, you don't. One of the reasons why is that, that I haven't seen a reason why I would want to go and, and, and get broadband because there's no what they call killer app. Uh, in the journal uh, a couple days ago, I think it was Holman said, said that, uh, Holman Jenkins said, said that there was one killer app, actually. It was Napster, and we killed it. <laughs> but but there's, no, there's no killer app. And, and, 
And, and so why isn't there a killer app? Well, well it's, it's a basic problem with networks that, that until you get a critical mass, uh, then it doesn't really make economic sense for somebody to go around and spend a lot of capital developing killer apps. And when you have a very small sort of almost cult group of people that are really broadband uh, now, uh, then it's only the sort of geeky 16-year-olds that, that have zero value of time uh, that, that uh, are working on that are work, working on these things. And so, and so there would be, I believe, a, a very strong uh, potential positive externality uh, from getting a, a very fast, and I mean very fast, broadband network kick-started. And the reason is that if you could get a critical mass, then you'd accelerate this sort of traditional S-curve adoption of technology, which is going to be very slow when there's something like a network involved. Uh, and if we got that accelerated, then there'd be things that you and I uh, potentially can't conceive of uh, that would emerge over time. Now, is that important economically? Well, there have been a lot of studies lately that have shown that the first spread, the first jump of the internet uh, into our lives and into the lives of businesses um, has uh, had a big effect on, on the economy. My favorite study uh, done by two of my former colleagues at the Federal Reserve, Steve Ulner and Dan Sickle, uh, shows that uh, a huge fraction, about half of the latest gains in productivity that ran us at least through this year into such a golden age came about from the first punch through uh, of, of communications and IT uh, and the revolution that it was associated with that. I believe that one of the reasons we got that big productivity gain is we got there first. That, that we were really the, the first country that, that was integrating uh, the scanner at the supermarket with what's going on at the factory. And it gave us a huge uh, competitive advantage. And that's one of the reasons why firms were so productive and our economy boomed so much. I think with broadband that I can conceive of applications that would have equal merit and, and equal productivity uh, potential. Uh, and I, I worry that if we're not the first ones uh, to the broadband revolution, uh, then we might fall behind our competitors who get there first, because a lot of other places have recognized the potential external benefits of broadband and uh, subsidized or even outright uh, had the government put fiber down uh, to people's doors. Now, um, I think that if we do uh, pursue something like, like the Rockefeller uh, bill or some, some other uh, subsidy, then we should be very aware of the types of concerns that, that Adam raised. But, but I can say that, that if you go back and, and look at uh, the history of tax policy in the U.S., uh, the notion that, that a subsidy turns into government regulation uh, it isn't really supported, I think, by the evidence. There, there have been, uh, for example, uh, six periods uh, that I can remember, uh, again, using the backs of my eyelids to calculate, uh, where, where the investment tax credit for all machines uh, was in place. And, and the R&D tax credit has been around for a long time. And I think most of the benefits of that R&D credit uh, are not uh, subject to regulation in, in any way. In, in fact, uh, I, I would argue that in innovation itself is, is usually the best way uh, to stay away uh, from government, because if you've got a new product, the government probably doesn't even know it, it exists. And so I think that the arguments for the credit are, are reasonably strong. Uh, I think that there's a big network externality out there that would argue for a subsidy. And finally, uh, I, I started with a joke about I don't have bodyguards, uh, because uh, I, I'm not a full-time uh, telecom guy. And, and finally, one of the interesting things about tax credits that makes them particularly attractive to me, probably just because I'm a little mischievous, is that if, if you do the theory and you look at who should support and who should oppose credits, well, uh, generally you find uh, that the people who uh, should oppose them are the existing uh, firms. And the reason is that, that all these monopolists spent lots of money on capital to lay their networks, and they didn't get a credit. And now what we're doing is subsidizing folks uh, to come in and compete with them. And generally in, in economics, the result is that, that the old firms dislike, old capital dislikes credit, and new firms like it. And so I think that uh, there, there are some qualifications uh, to apply to that. So if there's absolutely no potential of a new firm, I'll, I'll, one last sentence, uh, then the old firm will just get the credit, and that's that. Um, but I don't think that that in this vibrant industry is the likely outcome. And so I guess if I had to pick a broadband policy from all the ones I've seen, the credit is what I'd choose. Thanks. Thanks to both Adam and Kevin for their fine comments. Uh, we're going to move right into the second panel on broadband access, and we're, we'll take questions afterwards. It looks like we will have a, a reasonable amount of time for questions. Just so the panelists are aware how we'd like to run this, um, I'm going to remain standing. We actually have a slightly unbalanced panel. We have five panelists, 20 minutes total. Um, 
two of the panelists because they're the views have kind of, kind of gotten split up. Again, the panelists are aware. Uh, both Greg Simon and Gene Kimlin will have five minutes each. Each of our other three panelists, about three and a half. And I realize that's slightly unbalanced, but I don't do good with 20-second increments. So if you all will just bear with the uh, simple math on my part. Uh, and basically what I'm going to do is about one minute before you go, just kind of hopefully give a relatively unintrusive signal. Um, we have five panelists total um, for this. Uh, Ah, that's what happens when you have little crib sheets. Um, in addition to Greg and Gene, who I've mentioned, uh, we have Julia Johnson, Joan Marsh, and Rick Zimmerman. I'll be introducing each of them briefly as they speak. And if you just stay and use the microphones in front of you to save a little bit of time, that would be super. I uh, very much appreciate it. Um, enough being said, uh, let me start off with Greg Simon. Uh, Greg is former Chief Domestic Policy Advisor for Vice President Gore. He's currently President of Simon Strategies uh, and is here today representing Earthling. Greg? Um, I oh, think... I'm going to stand there, but I don't have a mic. You have mine if you want. <laughs> okay. Either way, I got a lot of paper. Thank you very much. I, I want to start by agreeing with Adam on something. Uh, Adam said that he recently went to Indiana where he was born recently, and I would like to agree that sometimes he sounds like he was born very recently, uh, especially on the remark about infrastructure socialism. If we didn't have rules about infrastructure, Senator Rockefeller would be still running a train. And sometimes he says he wish he were. Um, but we've had a long policy in this country of open networks. In fact, the cable network is the exception to the rule that the network owner cannot dictate how other people use the network on either end. What other company that has a pipe to your house dictates what appliance you use on the inside of your house? Second question, if you don't like Microsoft directing your computer to their websites, why would you like the cable company directing your television or your computer to their websites and to their content. The theme for my talk today is really four mergers and a funeral. Because what we've got is AT&T and TCI, and then AT&T and Media One, AT&T possibly Comcast, and AOL Time Warner. All you need to do is put those four mergers together, let them control the networks that dominate 50% of your consumer homes, and dictate what content comes into the network, what set-top box is at your house to get the program, and anybody who wants to put interactive content through that pipe into your house, into your set-top box, which has become your storage device with your video recording, it has become your home computer with multi-gigabyte memory, and it has become your interactive device for television, controlled by the cable company, which will guide your TiVo to the cable company shows. It will prevent you from interacting with non-affiliated content if they let it in. And it will strip out all of the other programming goodies that broadcasters and video-on-demand streaming companies want to put in. Cable has created an artificial scarcity of broadband capacity to your home through the cable modem. A cable modem is really a device to limit the capacity that you can get over the internet in your home. Why do I say that? They have a 750 megahertz pipe, and they use six of it for broadband internet. No wonder then, in the NCTA handout today, they say the ITV fight is not about internet content. ITV does not even use the internet. Bingo. Why? Because why would they let you use the internet if they can guide you to the cable channels that they control that all the capacity is devoted to? Consumers, not the cable company, should be at the heart of the new broadband architecture. This fight is not about telephony competition. It is not even about cable competition, because how many of you have a choice of cable companies where you live? Right. What this is about is who and under what principles will they be writing the rules for the broadband architecture where you hope to get your news, your video, your entertainment, your communications. Right now, the cable plant is at the center of the architecture. They determine what comes in and they determine what comes out. 
you, the consumer, should be at the heart of the architecture. Why is that? A recent study by the Consumer Electronics Association said, tying and bundling broadband with extra fees and service requirements is a turnoff for consumers. 72% of households with dial-up won't choose cable broadband if they're charged extra if they don't take the cable channel service. If we're interested in the market working, give the marketplace choices. If the network owner, for the first time, is allowed to control everything that rides over that track, then you are depressing investment in competition, you are depressing choices, and you will depress distribution of the service because consumers will be turned off by the fact that they have to buy only what the cable company offers them. Thank you very much. This is where the timing gets dicey, because now we start with the three and a half minutes thing. Yeah. Uh, our next panelist is the Honorable Julia Johnson, who I believe I last saw sitting down in Tallahassee in my past life, and I believe yours. Uh, Julia is the former chair of the Florida Public Service Commission and is now a corporate executive with Milcom Technologies. Thank you, and it's always a wonderful thing coming to Washington from the state of Florida. It's like escaping from the real world. After listening to the last presenter, I'm, I do feel as if I've escaped from the real world. As a, as a former regulator, one of the things that I do is, is step back and look at the policy, and, and I too agree, how does this impact consumers? What is this access argument all about? What are consumers really looking at? Now, I know we'll get to hear from Jean, who, who may have a little different perspective, but the whole aspect of open access that's a good idea. And I am certain that every single presenter up here would say open access is the way to go. Having multiple ISPs on a broadband platform is the way to go. The question is how you get there, when do you get there, and what's the approach that you take? One of the things that I would suggest that you do as we're analyzing and determining how to best pursue this is to look at some of the states, look at some of the jurisdictions as laboratories for how they dealt with this issue. And also look at two fundamental questions. When you talk about broadband, it, it's easy for us to stand here and, and, and talk about having multiple ISPs on the platform. But the calls that I get, even as, as in my role as the chair of Governor Bush's Internet Task Force, is first, broadband. How many consumers actually have access to broadband? And who's delivering it? And how is it being delivered? And can we come up with methodologies? Can we come up with incentives to ensure that in the first instance, they have access to broadband? And as we look at the secondary policy argument, which is when we do have this access to broadband, let's make sure that there are platforms to ensure that there are multiple ISP providers to get rich, robust, diverse content. I think that you first, though, step back and say, how does one impact the other? How do we first ensure that people have this access to broadband? One of the gentlemen talked earlier about killer apps. And, 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 I, and I often think you have to balance that. What's, what's, what's driving what? Well, maybe you don't have killer apps because you don't have broadband. You know, maybe it's not that you don't have broadband because you don't have killer apps. Getting this technology, getting the infrastructure to the consumers is an absolutely <coughs> critical process. And I have to say, as we look at what's been happening, who's been deploying the technology, I think we should applaud cable for making the investment, taking the risk, and starting to deliver. Certainly, the industry is still in its infancy, but there are technologies and there are companies out there delivering. Okay, how do we ensure, though? Let's, let's deal with this ISP issue. Should it be a free market solution? Or does it take government intervention? And what are we looking for? Well, if we say, I, I agree uh, totally with our elected officials that talked about all of the benefits of having multiple ISPs and having an open platform, I wholeheartedly agree. Again, how do you get there? The free market approach or the government intervention approach? 
I submit to you that public service commissions across the state are looking for first the answer to achieving the broadband. And if you look through the records, through the filings, to see whether or not they have looked at a forced access, I would submit that the answer comes back time and time again that that is not the proper solution. And boy, that was a quick three and a half minutes. <laughs> uh, let me just wrap up on, on one point. The reason why I would suggest that we look closely at a free market approach is because the market is, in fact, working. When you look at what AT&T is doing in terms of their projects and their demonstrations, which will be discussed a little earlier, Cox and some of the relationships that they started with some of the independent ISPs, I say that this is only the beginning and we should not stifle it by adding government intervention, but we allow consumers choice by allowing the free market to work. Uh, my colleagues at City Net will tell you that I'm horrible when it's three and a half minutes. It does fly, so I, ha I have a, a, some sympathy on the timing thing. Um, I will try to, when we run over a little bit, try to give Gene an extra minute or so on, on, the, on the back side if need be, so we, uh, everyone kind of has an equal thing. Uh, we're next going to hear from Joan Marsh of AT&T. Um, Joan has a couple specific things that she wants to talk about. She is AT&T's Director of Federal Regulatory Affairs and Law and Government Affairs. Joan? Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to be here to speak. Um, AT&T shares in uh, Rep Representative Boucher's vision of allowing access to the cable plant for multiple ISPs. We disagree strenuously with the observation that it's quick, it's easy, or it'd be simple, simple to implement. In fact, there's not even a single solution that I think would be appropriate for all the different type of plant that's out there. Um, AT&T for the last six months or more has had a trial in Boulder, Colorado to try to find a technical solution. Unfortunately, I have three minutes to tell you about it. So there are a series of slides I prepared. I'm not going to be able to make it through them, but let me give you the highlights, and I think they're available as a handout, and um, we'd be happy to meet with you later to talk about it in more detail. First, from a technical standpoint, there's enormous challenges to modifying the architecture to support multiple ISPs. Number one, there's no dedicated line. In the telco world, you have a copper twisted pair that goes from the central office to the home. Provider can be dedicated at either end. Cable world, you don't have that. You have shared cable plant that runs out through the neighborhood and delivers a shared signal to a number of houses. Very different world. Number one, there's limited bandwidth and it is finite. And that bandwidth has to serve not only all the cable um, subscribers, but it has to provide new digital video products. It has to provide voice products. It has to provide high-speed internet data. And it has to have an upstream, something that cable never used to have to worry about before the high-speed internet access product. Um, number three, given the shared architecture, very important concerns about privacy, security, and encryption. And all new systems need to be developed to ensure proper provisioning, quality of service, customer care. It's a whole new world out there when you partner with ISPs to ensure a quality experience. Nonetheless, in Boulder, AT&T figured out that it can be done. The solution is something called source address based policy routing. Now that would take me about 15 minutes to explain in detail. I'll try to do it in a half a minute. Basically, it requires the addition of new equipment, routing equipment, and it requires that you change the manner in which the IP packets are routed, dramatically different than how the IP network grew up. Um, and it, although policy routers exist right now, AT&T is using a Cisco policy router. They have never been used in this fashion before. Again, a whole new world. Nonetheless, what did we prove in Boulder, um, which concluded on June 1st, 2001, with four participating ISPs, and by the way, AT&T did not limit or edit or seek to control any of the content they provided. They provided all the content that they wanted to to their subscribers. Those four ISPs were Juno, Earthlink, Excited Home, and WorldNet. We wanted 10 ISPs to participate. We couldn't get them. We invited them to come. They couldn't come either because of resource issues. Um, there is a lot of capital and development issues that are involved. Um, but w the doors were open up to 10. We could only get four. What did we prove? We proved that the technical solution that we have proposed will work. And it's the technical solution that we plan to roll out in the New England area and in six communities around Boston this fall. Number one, 
We proved that we could develop systems that would allow us to partner effectively with ISPs, that would give ISPs a direct relationship with the customer and allow us to communicate with ISPs so the customer gets a very quality experience with the ISP of their choice. Number two, we got very positive, or three, we got very positive responses from our customer with software that we developed that made the product very consumer and customer friendly, that allowed the customer to manage the, the, um, the experience from their desktop, to control their selection of ISP, to customize their account, and make sure the experience is what they wanted. And, and most importantly, we determined that the operational model that we selected in Boulder is reliable and scalable because we do plan to continue to test it in a broader fashion in the Boston area and roll it out uh, as quickly as we can in our entire footprint. Um, so our next steps, we are moving on to the Boston area. Approximately six communities have been selected. And um, the plan is for the fourth quarter of this year. The equipment's being moved from Boulder out to England. We will move on to the difficult commercial issues with our ISPs on product tiers, on pricing. But to date, it's been a great success for us, and we're looking forward to the Boston area. Thanks. Thank uh, our next speaker is Gene Kimmelin from the Consumers Union. Uh, it concerns me, I just found out coming over here, that uh, Gene and I overlapped back in college. Um, I'm hoping that he doesn't remember that uh, during what I think was his junior year, I, I uh, ran the main campus cafeteria. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, his gastronomic experiences back when we were both a tad younger, haven't uh, lingered. But in his current capacity, he is co-director of the Consumer Union, Gene Kimmelman. Thank you. How solid are the rules? Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that kitchen experience has nothing to do with the sewer thing. In <laughs> <laughs> um, um, just like Greg, I actually want to agree with Adam, but on something totally different. I agree with him on tax credits for different reasons, but um, cons our Consumer Union is very concerned about um, broadband tech tax credits um, from the perspective of um, how do you really make sure they go where they're supposed to go, they do what they're supposed to do, and anyone can police them. Very different issues than were addressed before, but um, we do agree about the concern. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments because I happen to have agreed with everything Congressman Boucher said and virtually everything Greg said. I might have said it a little differently, but I agree, agree with all that. Just a couple things. Free markets, free markets. Oh, Julia, <laughs> how did cable get those free market wires through government-granted franchises? Government-granted franchises, the furthest thing from the free market. And my recollection, Greg, you may recall this, there were times when there were virtual riots in communities when cable companies blocked others trying to get franchises. Uh, down in North Carolina, I recall, was it Wilmington or someplace, TCI system, taking advantage of their government-granted rights to try to block competition, rampant practice in the cable industry. Um, infancy, yes, we have infancy here. And I believe Joan's right about this. There's probably a lot of reasons that are not a, comp a lot of companies there ready to come to the trials. And, and um, this is really early in the process. but. Uh, infancy was the argument that the cable industry also used in video. It was uh, not growing the way it should. Government was causing all kinds of impediments, and so it needed other special privileges. It needed uh, what telephone companies couldn't have, which was the right to own the content that went over their wires. And that needed, they needed that to grow, and certainly they did grow. Um, but before you get to broadband, look at the result in the cable industry. Uh, of the top ten most popularly watched cable programming networks, half owned by cable companies. Top 20, half owned by cable companies. Top 30, should I keep going? It's the same, it's the same. And most of the other things watched on television owned by the major TV networks, which also have free airwaves from the government um, and have built on that platform to create their dominance and now leverage it into cable. Um, so that infancy argument is attractive, but boy, it certainly can get you into an awful lot of concentration awfully quickly. And here is my concern. Uh, it's not that government does things right or wrong or markets do things right or wrong. The question is, how difficult is it to undo problems once they arise? And the history in cable is a horrid history of 
challenging companies that have a very dominant platform, uh, a dominant position in programming, uh, and convincing policymakers it's in their interest to take on such um, uh, powerful entities is not easy. You want to repeat that in broadband? Um, that's not the way the narrowband internet has worked. Um, and then let's talk one more time about markets and incentives. Um, do consumers want infrastructure? Sure. Consumers want a lot of things. Most of what they see in broadband now is way too pricey, and DSL price goes up, cable modem price goes up. It's kind of hard to see how that's real head, that head-to-head -head competition is really benefiting. But how, how does this market work? Well, let's look at what the cable industry itself said when Congress was considering the 96 Act. It said, deregulate us in our pricing, in our rates. And what will we be? We will be the local telephone committer. We are the other wire. We are there. We are ready. And they are not there. We are five and a half years past this. And the Wall Street Journal today described their ability to draw revenue from consumers as like drawing water from the faucet. Um, the history of that activity in the open free market is not very attractive for where we would go in broadband. I think the bottom line here, um, and, and, and one other comment, um, um, I hope AT&T is moving this direction. I hope Comcast will be as well as the rate things are going. Um, but another um, set of, of behaviors in the free market, Bob Allen at AT&T after the, the 96 Act passed said, that by last year they would be in 40 percent of consumers' homes with their local phone service. Um, resale was the first technological strategy. Project Angel Wireless was the second. Then um, Internet Protocol Telephony, oh, oops, they got ahead of themselves. They went back to switch telephony, and now it appears Comcast in their takeover bid says, no, 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 let's go back to Internet Protocols. The point being not that AT&T is bad or wrong or whatnot, it's that this is very difficult. People have not been able to figure out how to get to where they need to go. It's very expensive. Um, and the last thing in the world I think we want is to uh, promote more monopoly control of infrastructure and the ability to get all the content from only one source, that monopoly infrastructure company. Uh, to try to overcome these problems. That's not the right path. Is it possible that with open access, things might move more slowly? Sure, it's possible. Um, but if in the long run we end up with a telephone model where it wasn't the telephone company that figured out how to use the fax machine or the telephone company that invented the, it brought the narrowband internet and its applications, but it was using their wire and they made a fortune with everyone doing it. It seems to me that is a much better model for open competition and choice in the marketplace for consumers. So I think we would be wise to, um, to uh, bring the cable industry back to um, the, the platform that Congressman Boucher was talking about, where they have every entrepreneurial right to make money and just not discriminate against uh, content providers, and, uh, and then let them compete against the telephone companies. Thank you. Uh, our fifth and final, final speaker today uh, is Rick Zimmerman of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Uh, Rick is Senior Director for State te uh, Telecommunications Policy there. Uh, and then after that, it looks like we will have a good tw uh, 20 minutes or so for questions. Well, I want to start, as some of the other panelists did, by agreeing with a previous panelist. I'm going to agree with Gene that going into the phone business or into broadband is very difficult and very expensive. But I'm going to disagree in uh, one way, which is that adding new layers of government regulation on top of what already exists is not the way to make it easier or less expensive. That would only complicate things further. Uh, there are lots of reasons why cable is where it is in terms of telephone. One is that we've been concentrating on the broadband rollout. That's why I really have to shake my head after hearing Greg Simon and say, you know, there you go again. It's this, the idea that cable, who now is available, cable modem service available to 60 million uh, households across the country, 
60 million households across the country, cable modem service available. We brought it to people. We drove the phone companies to accelerate their deployment. We drove satellite companies. We drove everyone else to go faster on broadband. That we're creating an artificial scarcity is one of the more ludicrous statements that I have ever heard. Now, he said, we've got 750 megahertz of capacity. If you saw Joan's slide where she showed the segmentation on the largest part of that capacity from 54 to 550 megahertz, by law, we have to carry analog video channels in certain spaces within that megahertz. 500 megahertz approximately is taken up by law by other services. So there are lots of reasons why we've dedicated what we've dedicated to cable modem service. But the idea that we're creating artificial scarcity when we've put more out there, driven everyone else to do it, again, is really unbelievable. But apparently, Greg would rather have uh, others tell us not only uh, what to carry on our system, but how to invest our money, how to allocate the uh, bandwidth, how to do everything. Uh, I'm not sure in, in regards, you know, Adam mentioned infrastructure socialism. Uh, you know, it, it's not clear why under that scenario we shouldn't just have the government build broadband for everyone and then let other people decide what's going to be on these systems. The bottom line for cable is that we are committed to providing ISP choice. As Julia said, Joan indicated what AT&T is doing. Time Warner is currently engaged in technical trials. Cox has announced a technical trial to begin later this year. Comcast isn't currently engaged in a technical trial. All of them are trying to work out the technical solutions to how to provide multiple ISP choice to consumers. We have said that we will do it. We are working on the technical aspects of it. We are going to do it. The market is, in fact, working when it comes to access. So lastly, on interactive TV that was mentioned both by Congressman Boucher and Greg Simon, I would commend the piece to you that is sitting outside that Greg quoted from a little bit. There appears to be quite a bit of confusion about what we're talking about. You know, some people are never happy. The whole open access debate started out being about internet service providers providing service to customers through our wires. We said we'd do that. That's not good enough now. Now it's about unaffiliated content providers getting on our systems. What will it be next? I don't know. The bottom line is those that are big fans of government regulation rather than the free market are always going to be looking for some new way to regulate no matter what you do. I think that's what we have in this case. But as our piece says, the ITV fight is not about access to the Internet or Internet content. So there's a lot of confusion before you uh, move forward uh, in thinking about the relationship of interactive TV to the Internet, if at all, uh, I really think that, uh, that it would benefit you to, uh, again, to read this piece. And one of the main things is that the ITV industry today really is a nascent business. Greg gave you lots of hypotheticals, as did Congressman Boucher. All of these services that don't yet exist we don't know what the business model is. Lots of other folks are creating business models for ITV. We don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know what investors are going to say. We don't know what the consumer demand will be. So the idea of putting regulations in place now really seems like it would be a big mistake. The idea that, uh, that any of these hypotheticals and businesses that don't yet exist the idea that the government should step in today could only stifle investment and keep us from going where I think we're all agreed we want to be, which is robust competition for all of these services. Uh, finally, I guess I would add, for those of you that didn't see, there was another court case uh, that came out yesterday that said once again, so all the courts are now unanimous, that uh, the government, in this case the local government or state government, does not have the authority to impose forced access conditions on cable companies. One court even said that on First Amendment grounds that cable cannot be required to separate its content from the transport. So there are lots of uh, policy reasons, legal reasons why forced access is inappropriate. But the bottom line again is we have said we would do it. We are conducting technical trials. We are going to do it. The market is working. There's no reason for regulation. Thank you. First of all, uh, we're going to go to questions now. I did want to thank all the panelists, uh, both for the clarity and also the brevity of their comments. I know this is obviously a very hotly debated topic, wide-ranging views. Thank you for the cooperation from your moderator. Um, 
frequently the moderator starts with a question, but we've got 20 minutes. We have some people here. You're engaged in this day over day. If there are questions from the audience, let me ask there. Uh, I would ask that you, if you've got a question uh, and you want it directed for starters to a given individual, please indicate that. If not, I'm going to ask one or two. But are the yes, sir. Let's stop there. Do we have any volunteers from the panel? Otherwise, I get, get to pick on people. <laughs> I'll shot. I'll shot. Okay, Greg. What you have is that AT&T, which used to make you buy the black phone that you had to use because the depreciation schedule was 30 years and the black phone would last 30 years. When they got broken up, we said, okay, we're going to have competitive long-distance companies and we're going to have these open local phone companies that people can use the wires of to do all kinds of things and the local phone company can't tell you what you can use the wire for and they can't tell you what you can hook into the wire on either end. Then along comes the cable industry which has a completely different regulatory history all of which is recidivist monopolism. They tried to monopolize franchises, they tried to monopolize programming, they monopolized remote controls, they monopolized set-top box and now they want to monopolize access to their broadband network. It is a classic case that because the Congress never said once and for all cable companies are going to be open networks, we've had to bite at them every time they've come up with a new way of dominating the marketplace with their government-granted rights of way in franchises. Keep that in mind. When they wanted to piggyback on utility poles, the government said, okay, you get to use the utility poles. Now, if the Internet company tries to use the cable company pole, they're told you can't do that. Why? Because we have the power to stop you, not because we have the right to stop you. We have the power to stop you. So, well, what I'm going to ask that's is... that's small. Well, pardon me. The way we're going to operate this, happy to ask the question. We're not going to get debates from the audience. If there's anybody else who'd like to respond to the Greg's position before I ask for further questions? If not, let well, me just... Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, this is a question from Ms. Marshall, AT&T. The experiment that you conducted in Boulder sounds as an engineer's design. All these different proof is technical capability of rallies and signals. If regulators or marketers have been involved, the only thing we focus on is the consumer. That is, the consumer, the consumer, the they know, did they have any idea whose service they were routing over? Since all the services have open access to basically every site on the web, and with no content discrimination, I wonder what we've proved with respect to consumer numbers. Um, first, you're right, it was a technical trial because, quite frankly, the technical questions are extremely difficult and they are the first questions you've got to answer if you want to move forward. Second of all, AT&T's primary focus on this was the consumers. We don't have consumers, we're not selling product, we're not making revenue. Consumers don't want this product, we're not selling product. And our focus was not only making sure that the consumer experience was very high quality, but also we created this so there'd be multiple points of service. So the ISPs, the Earthlinks, the Junos could go out and use their muscle and their brand name to also sell this product. They're selling product over our plant, we're making revenue. You know, Wall Street has said this very clean, um, plainly, open access is a win-win. 
a win for the provider and a win for the ISPs, and we believe that. So we have, I think we proved a lot. We proved that A, it's doable, which wasn't clear before. We proved that we could create a reliable network, that we could scale that network, and we proved that consumers want it. As a matter of fact, we sent out, we invited consumers to participate. We got much more consumer interest than we could manage. Um, so I, don't, I think from a consumer perspective, it's been a huge victory as well. Well, let's see. First, we deregulated cable in 1984. That was because we had three over-the-air networks. Cable rates shot up about three times faster than inflation. Congress said, oops, then 1992 re-regulated. And uh, at least according to Reed Hunt, there were three or four or five billion dollars in savings. All I could tell for consumers is that most cable rates went flat, some went down. Then in the 96 Act, we started re deregulating again. And since then, rates are up about three times faster than inflation. Um, during the same period of time, um, almost the only increases in telephone rates, uh, in, in local telephone rates, the comparable wire, were ones that were mandated by the federal government in terms of decreasing long distance charges to add to your local phone bill. So for almost every dollar that long distance went down, local went up. Um, it's the closest comparison I have for a, a wire. Excellent. I do want to respond on that, which is that I, I think uh, uh, Gene is taking the wrong view because the FCC found in its most recent report a couple of things which uh, most importantly on a per channel basis the price of cable is down, not up. When cable rates have gone up, consumers have gotten more for their money. They have gotten more channels uh, on average uh, today, uh, they're paying 66 cents per channel rather than 69 cents per channel. They've got more value when you compare the monthly cost of cable that brings you, you know, hundreds of movies, hundreds of sporting events to the cost of taking your family to a football game, a movie, virtually any other form of entertainment, cable is the best value out there. And But even this year, even if you just compare to inflation, the basic rate was up 2.5%. Inflation was greater than 3%. Uh, it's true that higher programming tiers uh, were up a little bit more, but on a per channel basis, cable rates are down and not up. Can I just say that that's absolutely accurate, and what it reminds me of is the fact that in the 150 communities where there are two cable companies competing against each other, uh, measured on the cable industry's obviously preferred measurement here of all those channels, the extra ones they gave you that you never watch, um, uh, the price per channel is, uh, according to the FCC, anywhere from 13 to 30 percent lower than where you only have one cable company in the marketplace. Uh, can but, I follow up on uh, adding to the question, and perhaps this is something Jean may want to follow up on also, but when we look at the issue of, of open access uh, and, and multiple ISPs on a, on a platform, that doesn't necessitate lower rates. When you want competition and you want lower rates, you should be trying to get multiple pipes into the home. So when you look at whether or not government should intervene and slow down the process of investment and innovation, that's where I'm looking at it from an economic standpoint. More pipes mean more choices to get lower rates with those that are bringing it in. Having one pipe and making it have 10 ISPs uh, may not cure the, the, the problem. I'm going to, uh, ex I'll take questions in a second, but I'm going to make a comment and then ask you to think about a question for, for wrap-up. I would urge everyone in, in the room to think about one thing that this gentleman over here actually kind of touched on, um, but there often throughout the industry, and I mean that broadly, all telecommunications, all mediums, regardless of the competitive positioning, what people rarely talk about is kind of the, the dirty underbelly of the industry, nothing inappropriate, but it's the network. It's the transmission, regardless of the nature of the pipe. It's not the, even the optronics or electronics you put on it, but it's how did the stuff get there, not what do you flow over it, but how do things work? Very frequently, I would urge you, as you go through these very important pol public policy debates this week and in the months and years ahead, it's really easy to focus on the consumer, the marketing, the spin and the hype. If, as you go through your debates and as you advise the folks you're associated with, if you don't become highly familiar with 
the networks itself, and I use that advisedly, all the technologies, the transmission types, how the stuff really works. You may come up with great policy, but regardless of what that policy is, regardless of who agrees with you or disagrees with you, when you walk off the platform and walk away from the headlines, you may very clearly have some very real problems in that becoming an economic and a physical reality. And that applies, again, regardless of technologies, regardless of companies. But it's something that people very frequently do not talk about up here. It's hard, it's hard to master. If you don't, though, the pitfalls are immense for all of us in the broader sense. I, I do that. Uh, I'm going to take the question back there. But at the end, I'd like everyone just to address very briefly. This whole discussion has been in terms of the consumer, and there's no differentiation. Uh, having spent 20, 20 years in telecom and 14 years in water and sewer, um, <laughs> is there any differentiation, and does it matter in terms of different groups of consumers? For example, the residential consumer or the commercial consumer who at home is the residential consumer. Is there a difference? Does it matter depending on which policy choices you, you make? Because I do think that is at least something that we should think about as we move forward policy-wise. But I believe there's a gentleman over here with a question. Thank you. Um, it's on broadband tax credits, actually. Uh, because the bills are usually described as digital divide with bills, and yet broadband in the areas where there might be a Yeah, when you have Kevin first, yeah, and then sure. Adam, if you'd like to respond also, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah, very, very quickly, it depends on how competitive the marketplace is. If there's a monopoly and they get a credit and it's cheaper for them to supply the service, then they don't necessarily have to pass the cost savings on to consumers. Uh, the hope would be that the, that the bill would be designed in a way that you stimulate enough competition that the cost savings would pass on uh, to consumers with, with lower rates. And there's also uh, a, a natural tendency for the cost of in installing things to go down as you do it more often. Uh, and, and, and so I think that you could expect that not just the direct effect of the credit and lowering costs, but there'd be, there'd be further effects as well as, as you spread along the, uh, the diffusion curve, but only if market power isn't, isn't really significant. And, and that, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, briefly, I, I agree with a lot of what Kevin said, but yeah, if you wanted to rededicate the credit to like an individual voucher for buying broadband, they'd be better off, probably better served consumers. But I wouldn't be advocating that, of course. The fact of the matter is, is I, I just don't believe anyone has a natural and inalienable right to certain types of broadband technologies. And I think the fact of the matter is we have this sort of, if you build it, they will come attitude. I don't necessarily think all consumers want broadband. A lot of people operate with narrow band quite, you know, quite handily, or they use broadband at work and they come home and don't worry about it. Other people, you know, I don't want to use just anecdotal reasoning here, but my folks, I think about my folks, these primitive creature Neanderthals, my folks, you know, they don't give a damn about broadband, and there's millions of Americans like them. So in some cases, I, I think it is not, quote unquote, like Kevin said, special in the same way as, say, like a water line for sewer or maybe even electricity. You could make a much better argument there than with something like broadband, especially in light of the fact that we have multiple choices, including the wireless option, which isn't a pipe at all. And I don't want to get in the business of subsidizing pipes when maybe the best option is not a pipe at all, but something wireless. Last question from the floor. Yes, sir. Sure, this is a question about the broadband cable, but I'd like to direct it to our tax panelists. Uh, are you aware of any, any studies or any evidence on the backs of your eyelids, uh, studies or hunches, about whether the requirement that pipe deployers whether it's a wired pipe or a wireless pipe, the broadband deployers who are building the actual infrastructure they're being run over are currently being in the telephone area, currently disincentivized or in the cable area, would they be disincentivized from deploying residential areas if they have to open up their networks to uh, allow them to connect? How, I mean, obviously there is some disincentive, but how significant is that? in today's uh, uh, debate over 
Yeah, Adam, why don't you go first this time if you're interested? Uh, well, there's, there's, there's lots of work on the issue of forced access and the incentives it provides, but so many of these costs, these regulatory costs, are indirect, and it's difficult to know what the results will be in this marketplace. There's all these hidden opportunity costs out there. Uh, there is, uh, if you come up afterwards, I'll recommend a couple of things you, to take a look at, but the fact of the matter is, is that I think you can make a, a pretty damn good argument that if those sorts of incentives or disincentives are in place, uh, there's a question of who will build the vehicle. If everyone, you know, sharing is not competing in my book. And if you have to share the primary vehicle you hope to develop for consumers, then the question is, as Stephen Breyer best said in his concurring opinion in the Supreme Court case on this, that if everyone has to share the vehicle, who will build the vehicle in the first place? And that's my primary concern with regards to broadband. Right, and, and, and Adam's right, but the concern really is, is just one about, you know, it's economics about the price. So, so if you charge, depending on what the price is that you charge for uh, unbundling the, the, the investment that you make, then it might be that you care a lot about the requirement to do it or that you don't care, care at all. It's, it's re really in, in the price. I, I think that the arguments that have been made uh, over time uh, is, have been that the, the prices uh, are, are too low on, on one side, the folks who have to sell it, and too high uh, on the other side. I saw an interesting uh, piece of evidence. There's a, a new study which, which I commend to you by uh, Bob Crandall uh, out on why the Celex uh, failed. And he found that the ones that invested in their own machines uh, had a significant competitive advantage, whereas the ones that tried to, to pay the price, remember it's all in the price, uh, didn't uh, succeed and most of them are bankrupt. It suggests that there's a significant advantage to owning the machine, which suggests that the prices to me uh, must have been too low. Uh, and, and so, so if the price, if the, I mean, excuse me, too high. Uh, and, and if the, the prices were too high, then, then I doubt that the unbundling requirement had much effect uh, on, on investment because the folks doing the investments would have known uh, that, that the folks trying to, to use those fees would just would just go bankrupt ultimately anyway. Okay. Greg, do you want to do a follow-up? I'm not an economist, but I have slept at a Holiday Inn recently. <laughs> and I just want to make the one point. If we didn't share in the telephone world, we would not have the Internet, period. I, just a, I mean, a, a quick comment. You know, we've had the comparison again of telephone to cable, electric to cable, whatever. You know, these uh, businesses have very different histories. Yes, it's true we had a government granted franchise, no longer by law an exclusive franchise, but we paid for the right to use the public rights of way, etc. We never had a guaranteed rate of return like the phone companies or the electric companies. So if you do go back in history and look at the genesis of each industry, there are very clear differences why our networks are private networks, why telephone companies have to open up. But if you are looking for some kind of regulatory parity, then the answer is not to put new regulations on us, it's to seek deregulation for all. I think we should put both of them in the sewer and make them fight. <laughs> <laughs> and may I say on that note, for those of us who are now dedicated to the sewer, we'd like everything to run to the sewer and we'd like to be the vehicle for it, but that's probably a parochial interest. Uh, it's uh, a minute shy of 1.30, we're going to cut it off at this point. First of all, let me thank the panelists for a superb job. Very much appreciate that. I wanted to uh, again thank the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee and the Broadband Task Force for sponsoring this event. Uh, and, and once more, repeat the commercial for their next event, which is uh, coming up next week just down the hall in room SC5. And then there's an e-learning event on September 11th. Anyway, thank you all so much. I think the panelists may stay around for a few minutes if they're in for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Good. Thank you.